And what we do at We Do is <laughs> uh, work toward a just world that really promotes and protects human rights, gender equality, and the integrity of the environment. And that advocacy work that's at the heart of our mission and our vision really first emerged prior to the Rio Earth Summit in 1992. Um, the organizing that was happening around this by our amazing uh, founders and leaders um, and pioneers, many of whom are pictured here, allowed just an incredible network of activists from around the world to find ways to provide their input into this really pivotal point um, in developing our, our UN structures and frameworks around sustainability and sustainable development. And that's really led to our understanding of our two goals as we do this work. And that is first, that women are really empowered in these spaces and any decision-making spaces to recognize uh, their rights to be a decision maker, to be leaders, to be advocates at, at these crucial issues. And then secondly, to ensure that the outcomes of any of these decision making policy processes, that the ultimate policies and plans and practices that are emerging are gender responsive, are environmentally and socially just, are effectively implemented are really working at that intersection that we're working at, which is women's human rights and the integrity of the environment and sustainable hey, development. Tara, yes. Super quick. Um, are you sharing your screen? I don't think any of us can see it. Oh, well, that would, I really thought I was. Apologies <laughs> for that. <laughs> Let awesome. me try it one more time. Perfect. Now we can there see we it. There we go. Yes, thank you so much. All right, so. Uh, this was the first slide. Um, the second one, when I was talking about Rio and our amazing uh, pioneers and founders of We Do listed uh, or shown here, um, our first goal and some examples of women claiming their rights as decision makers and then leading into our second goal. And the spaces that we work in really are the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, including uh, the Green Climate Fund, which is a part of the financial mechanism under that. Obviously, we're working on the SDGs and the Generation Equality Forum um, coming up at the, the 21st, 25th anniversary of the Beijing um, Declaration and Platform for, for Action, which is concerning women's rights. So I know these are some spaces in which you're familiar with in, these, in this series, and we're working in them in a very strong network um, in connection and solidarity and collaboration with transnational feminist movements worldwide. So I want to start off looking at gender just climate solutions with this quote by our amazing founder, Bella Absug, former US uh, congressperson and uh, feminist icon, wearer of amazing hats. And one of her most famous quotes is this idea that women are not going to be simply mainstreamed into the polluted stream. Um, that we're really changing the stream, making it clean and green and safe for all. Every gender, race, creed, sexual orientation, age, and ability. And for me, this quote really resonates because it highlights that the question at the heart of our work is not the question of how do we add more women into climate action, um, into decision-making processes, into outcomes, into funding, but really how can we ensure that gender justice is at the very heart of everything that we're doing, at the heart of designing and implementing true solutions to, to our climate catastrophe. So I have a short video um, that I think does an excellent job of looking at the ways in which our, our climate crisis has to be looked at with an intersectional lens, has to be understood as the symptom of broken political and economic systems, and how that ultimately leads us to recognizing that the solutions that address these true root causes have to be rooted in gender justice.
Tara, if there's supposed to be sound, um, will you pause that and then yeah, let go me back to make sure that the sound is... If you go on the sharing screen capability thing, there should be like a little checkbox um, in the bottom left hand corner. So if you unshare your screen really quick and then go back into sharing it, um, just check that box where it says share the audio. There we are. Perfect. The climate and environmental crisis is rooted in an economic model that exploits people and planet while increasing inequalities and violence. States and corporations repress people fighting for access to natural resources, indigenous people and ethnic minorities, rural women and many others. However, Movements around the world are resisting and creating solutions to local needs for land, water, food, and energy. From Pacific Island feminists to the Black Mesa Water Coalition, frontline communities are building sustainable, long-term solutions. What if we replace profit with safety, well-being, justice, health, and sustainability? What if people and planet were the center of our solutions? What if we listen to stories of resistance and connect with feminist and ancestral knowledge? It's time for change and the redistribution of wealth and resources. It's time to hear feminist voices and build solutions that benefit all people and the planet. feminist vision for a healthy planet, I want to dig into some of the ways in which gender and climate are really connected so that we can understand that there's gendered impacts and experiences and perspectives associated with every aspect of the climate crisis um, that, that makes it even more important to recognize just the comprehensive nature um, that our solutions need to take. So as we look at crop failure, we recognize that in many places, women are experiencing increased uh, burdens of work in order to participate in food production. Women worldwide are 43% of the agricultural workers um, that are creating the food on which we live. In terms of water, women often have a role uh, walking to access safe water and the ways in which women's time is spent, both in terms of fetching water and in terms of fuel, um, really impacts on their ability to have access to educational opportunities, access to leisure time, and, and this, this unpaid um, burden of, of care that women are also experiencing um, as they are often the primary caregivers in their family is also you know, another dimension of the ways in which women's time is highly impacted by the natural resources that are available and accessible and to which they have rights. We also see that women have a higher incidence of mortality in natural disasters, although that varies very much, of course, by the type of disaster and where it's happening. Um, but we also know that in post-disaster situations, women are, are likely to be uh, further traumatized by the, their inability to have access to uh, safe spaces and again to safely uh, access the natural resources that they need to in order to survive. Um, this is something that of course becomes even worse um, with conflict and uh, the ways in which these, these overlapping oppressions are, are really uh, visible. Um, and we've even seen now here as we are facing a global pandemic that the, the early research is that women are more likely to be experiencing anxiety and depression regarding what's happening. Um, so we see the ways in which this is manifested really just in so many different situations, although of course it's going to have a very local context as well. 
Um, I've already touched upon caregiving slightly, um, and that's al also, I think, something that's been very much highlighted by our current crisis as well. And, and migrant justice is also something that we're really concerned with um, as this crisis continues with coronavirus, and we already recognize the ways in which uh, women uh, as refugees and as migrants and as facing displacement um, are subject to these these overlapping intersecting um, oppressions and inabilities perhaps to to access the full suite of healthcare and education and other resources that they need. So these linkages that are happening are really worldwide. We know that there are systemic and structural patterns and issues happening here. So back in 2016, we do worked with other partners to put together the existing evidence. So if you really wanted to dig into some of the stats around what I was just discussing, this is the publication to go to, to look at the intersections um, with health, with agriculture, with water. Um, but we've also worked to really understand what this means in a more regional or local context. Uh, looking, for example, in Canada, and then just most recently working with the Sierra Club to, to detail all the latest research of the ways that gender and climate change are intertwined within a US context. Um, there are a lot of really fascinating case studies in this work, and a lot of them are coming out of a post-Katrina context as well. So I think it's just really pertinent for our time. But as we think about the ways in which we need to understand what's happening, that we need to have a deep gender analysis um, and bringing that to the global level, it's important that we have forums to do so. So the Women and Gender Constituency is one of the spaces in which we organize. It's an observer constituency to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC. So there are nine different recognized observer constituencies right now. So we have a number of member organizations and an advocacy network that's even broader than that. Um, and, and this is a space where women are bringing their local understandings of the climate crisis to this, this policy making space that's trying to really address it at a global level. And women are learning the process, they're learning how the, the text works, how the negotiation works, so that we can further engage with it. And from that, we've really been able to hone in on what are our key demands for appropriate climate action in this area. And obviously, uh, we want to talk about everything being human rights based, everything having gender justice at the heart of it. And the ways that, that manifests can be in looking at a just transition um, to ensure that it really is equitable for all. Um, it includes having strong sexual and reproductive health and rights. So SRHR is a, is a pivotal piece of this. Um, it recognizes that for any climate action, we have to break free completely from fossil fuels and really move the money from war and dirty energy to true climate solutions. We have to put people, not profit, not markets at the center of our solutions. And, and look at more democratic forms of the ways in which we own and access energy. We have to recognize food sovereignty and protect our incredible food systems on which we live and look at ecosystem-based approaches. We also have to know what does not work. And so we've drawn some really strict red lines and said that geoengineering and uh, and bio uh, energy, carbon capture and storage are really these no-go spaces for us. And as we're creating this world, we wanna recognize both what is sustainable and what isn't. So I do have another short 90 uh, second video that'll be the last video I show you, I promise, that really shows a little bit more of what's happening and how the WGC is bringing forth these demands in a space such as, as COP, the Conference of the Parties in Madrid. This one I couldn't embed, so we're going to just pop over here and 
we'll see if it still loads. Revolution that is happening now with the world is going to be lead uh, with the women and the indigenous peoples. We have stories about that, about the cycles of the earth, about the cycles of humanity. When we talk today about a voice feminist, transnational and unified, when we talk about this voice unified feminist, it is defined by all its diversity, it is extremely rich. My name is Bridget Burns. I'm the director of the Women's Environment and Development Organization, also known as WeDo. I'm one of the co-focal points of the Women and Gender Constituency, which is a collective of women's rights, uh, feminists, gender rights advocates from really around the world, covering every region, who come into the space of the climate change negotiations to make sure that women's human rights are a part and central to climate action. So for us, as feminists coming into this space, we fully recognize that the climate change talks are not a feminist space. They are not even a space that is trying, in our minds, to move us away from business as usual but it is potentially the only and best space that we have to deal with this global climate crisis because we do need all countries on board to be able to achieve the impact that we're trying to see. I wish I could show you more of that, um, but I'll, I'll let you know later on where you can see the full 10 minute version of that. Um, so I think that gives you a little bit of a glimpse into uh, the WGC and the activists and climate leaders that are at the heart of, of bringing these voices into the climate negotiation space. And one of the things that we do in this space is we really want to showcase and amplify specifically something that we do called gender just climate solutions. And I know that's also the name of my talk, but this is also just a program within um, the women and gender constituency that I want to highlight for a few minutes. And these are solutions from around the world. And we've got a, an online database of the ones that we've highlighted over the past five years. We have a publication that's published, of course, in French and Spanish as well, because we want to be as accessible as possible. And then we have posters that can be pulled out of the publication that really highlight, again, all of these intersections between gender and climate change and the differentiated impacts and experiences and considerations. So when we think about gender just climate solution, I wanted to go through some of the criteria that we use to review all of the applicants because I think this kind of gets to the heart of this question of what is a gender just climate solution. So for example, we're looking at equal access to everyone. We're looking again at ensuring that we're not adding additional burden to women's workload, which tends to be disproportionately higher than men's. We're looking at the ways in which it is improving lives and livelihoods, and access to food, access to healthcare, access to safe water. We're looking, of course, at this foundation of rights and participation and the ability to be making decisions and to recognize the importance of local groups and local leaders and community-led action that really understands what those local needs are and can respond to those. Additional criteria really hone in on that even further. So we want something to be locally led, not led from the outside. We want something to be sustainable that requires a low input of resources over time so that it really can be maintained. Obviously, we want climate results. So that's mitigation, that's actual reduction in emissions, that's adaptation. And then we wouldn't be highlighting these solutions if we didn't see the incredible potential of them to be replicated, to be shared, to be spread and scaled up, of course, within an appropriate local context and, and, and done so in a way that's really thoughtful, because we think these locally led solutions are what's going to lead to a much larger scale transformation. And and as you know, we go back to what I was talking about a few minutes ago, we recognize that everything is interconnected. And we really wanna see the ways in which these solutions have highlighted those connections to peace, to food security, to health, water, and sanitation. So here's an example of one of the gender just climate uh, solutions that we've, 
featured. And it's this Bungaroo technology that's being deployed in India, and they're looking at some other places to deploy it as well. Trupti Jain is featured there. She's the co-founder, she's an engineer, she's a gender justice advocate. And in this scenario of recognizing the ways in which climate change is leading to ever more uh, challenges in terms of rain and irrigation scarcity and the way that that impacts on uh, food production and incomes. Bungaroo was, was formed as a, a technology that, that does two things simultaneously, which is really exciting. So it's both saving crops from water logging during monsoons by storing the water, and then it's able to release that water later so it can ensure adequate irrigation during the dry seasons. But the the reason that we're really interested in this as a, as a true gender just solution is the ways in which women are integrated throughout the process. So they are promoting the, the technology, they're leading the trainings on it, um, they are being paid for their work, and this is all operating within a co-ownership model so that we are seeing real gains in incomes and livelihoods. So another aspect of climate leadership. So we looked at Trupti, who's leading this gender just climate solution, is looking at women's participation in these actual climate talks. So we can see here that there was not a lot of progress between 2009 and 2019, although there's there was some. Uh, but I could tell you in 2018, women made up 40% of their national delegations instead of 39%. So progress isn't always steady. Um, and of course, there's regional variation with women's participation as delegates, as representatives of their nat national governments in this process. And, and you can see some of that regional variation here. Uh, we work at in these processes as well to ensure that you know we're bringing the gender just climate solutions and the advocacy work of the women and gender constituency to these negotiators um, to ensure that that they're able to see these issues and raise raise them up but we want to also see women's participation in this process so we work directly with training and capacity building of women leaders and thus far we have worked with 143 different women, um, sometimes sending them to multiple meetings, multiple negotiation se sessions, representing 67 uh, countries. So we've been doing this work since 2009. We're really a leading um, travel fund in this area. And we've also done additional training um, for additional women to understand how to be more effective negotiators in this process. Now, the reason I say that we're a leading travel fund in this area and share our numbers is because I ultimately want to talk about how this is not enough. You know, this is not a complete solution uh, because the idea that we're going to continue pouring money in um, to try and improve women's participation, this, uh, this is wonderful for trying to build the participation of specific women over time and have them develop as leaders, but ultimately, uh, we're only seeing uh, two to three percent of the overall women in the delegations that we're able to work with. And when we look at this graph, which is women as heads of delegation, so looking not just at participation but at leadership, you can see really why continuing to wait and continuing to invest more time into travel funds isn't going to get us to a place of gender parity. Because when there are major years of negotiations, such as 2015, when the Paris Agreement was decided, that we are seeing that women are having less chance to participate. So even though women's leadership and participation may be growing overall, over time, uh, they're, they're not gaining power in the spaces with the most power with the most decision-making and influence over the outcomes of these climate negotiations. So data is really important so that we can highlight this. And we really believe in the importance of, of just showing uh, these inequities. And, and for me, that's one of the most powerful graphics of looking at the fact that this is not a steady rise over time, which is the assumption of most people that you know, we're gonna catch up to gender parity eventually. Um, 
a colleague, Tatet, is featured here talking about the importance of statistics. And we do have both an app and a website called the Gender Climate Tracker, which among other things, looks at women's participation specifically um, in the negotiations country by country. Um, but it also looks at the ways in which gender has been integrated into countries' individual pledges of what they're going to do to achieve the, the Paris Agreement, which are called their nationally determined contributions. And it also looks at the ways in which gender may or may not have been referenced in various texts and decisions that have come out of the negotiations. And we really believe in putting this knowledge um, in people's hands literally with an app so that they can uh, be from a civil society perspective better advocates to their negotiators and so that negotiators for example can see the ways in which gender has been integrated so that they can better ensure that it's appropriately considered in new text so data is also key when we're talking about gender just climate finance uh, and climate finance simply is the money that funds climate action we look at this most recent data that we have about it worldwide and we see that our investment in fossil fuels at 242 billion dollars is greater than our total climate finance flows and all of this is really inadequate to the task so uh, those ndcs those nationally determined contributions the current ones which will not actually achieve the paris agreement are still estimated to cost 13.5 trillion dollars we're looking at a yearly price tag of up to $300 billion to address adaptation needs and up to $300 billion to also address loss and damage. So we have these twin uh, questions, which is why are we still financing fossil fuels and how can we finance actual climate justice at the level of ambition that we need? And we work in multiple ways on this and one way is working directly with climate funds such as the green climate fund uh, so working to ensure that women's organizations really understand the processes so that they can partner with organizations that are receiving some of this funding directly and we're working with leaders such as Wenun, who's the executive director of climate watch thailand to really highlight what our experiences have been in advocating in these spaces and doing webinars worldwide in multiple languages, trying to really highlight how women's organizations that are doing those gender just climate solutions on the ground can actually start engaging with the potential level of funding that they need to implement them and scale them up. But we're really waiting for an entire paradigm shift. And I don't mean waiting for, we're trying to shift the paradigm as well. That's what we're trying to do with so much of our action. So we have global military expenditures, for example, of $1.8 trillion. And we want to think about how we are ultimately moving that money away from war into, for example, girls' education. So providing universal education for boys and girls worldwide in low and middle income countries would only cost $39 billion a year. Um, and would create a really meaningful emissions reduction according to Project Drawdown um, from which this data comes. And there's so many ways that we can start to think about innovative ways to really shift money and financial transaction tasks, at taxes, international airline passenger levies, solidarity taxes. We know that this money has to move, so we need to be asking how we can move it. As we think about uh, other ways to really engage, we realize that we need more policy frameworks. So we've been doing some exciting work with ICRW and some other partners and collaborators on really what is a feminist foreign policy and what does it look like? And for the climate aspects of that, we really are looking again at how can women uh, participate in the process of their country's foreign uh, policy? How can there be a real gender lens? How can we ensure that there is a commitment to actually reducing emissions and ensuring that there's a commitment for governments paying into the climate finance um, mechanisms the way that they should be and ultimately ending fossil fuel subsidies? And so these are all parts of a feminist foreign policy because without this 
climate ambition and climate action, we're not able to have gender justice. Another, you know, set of framework that's emerging that I'm sure many of you um, would be interested in is the Feminist Green New Deal. So we've been working on this within a coalition of women's rights and climate justice organizations, just a few of which are highlighted below. There's many more partners and collaborators um, involved and ever able to shape the direction of this initiative. And it's really trying to highlight this opportunity that we have right now with the Green New Deal to look at what rights-based policies and programs can be. And then, of course, once again, recognizing what are these global implications of, of U.S. climate action. So tying things back to the feminist foreign policy and recognizing that our work is not only going to affect America and Americans, um, but really is important and has real impacts um, the same way that our emissions do on, on people worldwide. So there are 10 key principles, not in any order, but I wanted to quickly highlight those, even though um, I feel at some point I might sound a little bit like a broken record because these are some of the issues that have arisen earlier. Uh, we want gender analysis. We want to, to recognize and have the data of the various ways in which there are gendered impacts and experiences and perspectives. Um, we want to recognize again that there's no such thing as just a domestic climate policy. We're all in this together. We have to really confront these, these deep entrenched structures of patriarchy and racism and we want to ensure that we have frontline leadership there. Um, at the beginning of the video, I showed um, Ty Lee from Brazil was speaking and she was talking about, you know, what a revolution looks like and what, um, and a revolution means that she is on the front lines and she is able to highlight what is needed for her, um, for her survival. And we're also looking at the ways that we can really understand the systematic nature of our unsustainable production and consumption cycles. We're looking at advancing reproductive justice. Again, SRHR is critical. We're looking at these community-led solutions and looking at ensuring that we are recognizing false solutions such as geoengineering as false solutions because they're not addressing the underlying root causes such as our unsustainable production and consumption cycles. We want to really look at regenerative economies and feminist alternatives to our economic systems. And we want to ensure that youth, um, as well as multiple generations, are really co-creating these movements and that everyone's leadership is, is recognized. So that leads us into kind of my, my closing thoughts before we open it up for, for questions and I hope more of a discussion, which is, you know, mapping out so many of these principles and visions and ideas to, to this very moment. And, and it, we do, we're really thinking about it in this tripartite framework. And that is slowing down, taking the time to recognize that we uh, need to reflect and respond. I say as I accidentally touch my face that I've been in quarantine for 13 days now because I was on an international trip. And, uh, and that as a community, we have to come together in solidarity. And that's where we're going to find our resilience and find our reflection in this moment. We also recognize that this is um, you know, a really pivotal moment. So we need to be analyzing and strategizing about all of these intersections that we're seeing about the ways in which this can uh, shape uh, upcoming climate action, upcoming economic systems, uh, and so that we can really be poised to, to understand and to act when appropriate. And at the same time, we're continuing to do our work. We're figuring out new ways of connecting with women leaders, um, doing more online organizing, which we'd already done a lot of as members of transnational feminist movements. Um, but really returning to that um, idea of response and resilience at, at the beginning of, of ensuring that we recognize that this is a really embodied crisis and that we're all experiencing it in many different ways. And so I just wanna also create that space to make sure that we are 
taking the time to be reflective and to have those conversations as we move into our, our questions and discussions. And to, to help uh, pivot towards that, I wanted to, to share another quote by one of our, our We Do pioneers that I think is as pivotal now as it was uh, in 2004 when she gave it as part of her acceptance speech for the, the Nobel Peace Prize. So Wingari Matai said, today we are faced with a challenge that calls for a shift in our thinking so that humanity stops threatening its life support system. We are called to assist the earth to heal her wounds and in the process heal our own, indeed to embrace the whole of creation in all its diversity, beauty, and wonder. Recognizing that sustainable development, democracy, and peace are indivisible is an idea whose time has come. So I'm really looking forward to the ways in which we can, um, I'll, I'll pop this back up later so you can see the ways in which you can continue to connect with our work and then I can um, respond to your questions um, after this space that I'm very much here in real time now for as long as we wanna be in conversation. Yes, so with questions, if you guys want to send them via chat, or if you want to do the raise hand function, and I kind of can go unmute you and put your video on if you want, um, you can ask that way, whichever you prefer. I see a raised hand. I'm very excited now. <laughs> and uh, wait, what do I do? Start my video. Okay, there you go. Can I do it? You gotta come over here, babe. Um thank you for what you're doing, but what can young people do? Oh, that, oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> so young people can do a lot. Um, there, you know, part of any solution is first understanding the problem. So recognizing that when we're talking about something like climate change, that we are talking about this big, nasty, entrenched problem that has to do with the entire way that we've organized our world and our society. Is a, is a big step forward. But when you're talking about uh, climate action with your, your friends and when you are planning things, it's always a good idea just to look around the room and see who, who's there, whose voices do you have in your groups? Um, are you ensuring that people that are experiencing the impacts are the people that you're talking with? Um, are, do you have both boys and girls in your group? Uh, it there's there's a lot to do once you turn 18 which I know you're not quite there yet um, but in terms of voting because ultimately we really want to think about solutions to our, our climate catastrophe that are um, happening at a policy level it is not just about our individual actions it is about accountability from our governments and from our corporate and, and state actors to really um, put in place systems that fundamentally change the ways in which we work so that we can uh, promote a, a truly healthy planet. And, you know, there's a lot to be done uh, in terms of just getting out on the street and marching. So, you know, one of the, the pictures we have here, well, both of them actually are different actions. So it's important to show up and make sure that your voice is heard. And I think that there's a lot of young people your age that are showing up um, the next time that we're able to organize in person. And until then, we'll be organizing online. So we have a question via the chat. Um, so what is your favorite part about your job? <laughs> I love that question as well. Um, so, 
I work really closely with the, the Women Delegates Fund in, in my particular role, and I really appreciate when we're able to do um, regional training workshops. So we're sitting in a room with women coming from different uh, countries who are bringing their shared experiences to the table, and we're trying to figure out how these complex negotiations work and the history and the politics of them and trying to figure out ways in which women can share their stories and can work together and can collaborate as negotiators in this space. And that's really the favorite part of my job because then I get to the negotiation. So after we've had kind of this uh, feminist solidarity time, um, being at the actual negotiations and seeing the women in these trainings getting together in groups to go through and say, oh my gosh, did you understand what's going on with this text? What can we do here? And, and really starting to do that, that mobilizing and knowing that they have this network that's going to serve them for, for years as they're growing in this, this process. Um, that's, that's the part of my job that I really just appreciate the most. And also because it's filled with friendships, um, which is, I think, crucial to a lot of job satisfaction. Perfect. Um, another question that we have is, are there chapters in US states or on college campuses? So we're not actually a membership organization. So we work with a broad range of different feminist organizations, some of which are membership organizations and some of which are not. What we do have is a newsletter and uh, we will occasionally have calls to action, letters you can sign, things like that. Um, but we don't necessarily have chapters. So there's definitely ways to stay engaged with our work, um, which we would love for you to do. Uh, but not necessarily organizing in that type of way or that type of group. And it's, it's obviously open to anybody that is finding that these values um, really resonate with their ideas um, around how we actually address this, this crisis. Awesome. So there is a question from Erica. I'm just going to go ahead and unmute her really quick. All right. Thank you. Yeah, Sorry, my uh, video isn't attached here on, on my laptop, but um, otherwise I would show it. Um, I was just wondering, I'm sure you've heard of a lot of the environmental, uh, I don't want to say improvements, but changes that we've had from the pandemic going on right now. Like, um, you know, they've had like record low pollutions in China, low uh, pollution levels in China. And um, things in, you know, Italy, like Venice, the water's running clear, things like that. Um, yeah, I just wanted to get your opinion. Do you think that this pandemic, what's happening now, is kind of almost a wake-up call? And um, how you really think that we're going to be coming out of this, maybe coming together more as a society? Um, uh, and what kind of things are going to change from there. I'm just curious what, what yeah. your thoughts are. Absolutely. So I have a couple of responses. And first is I'm really um, hesitant to recognize some of these changes that we have seen as any sort of silver lining. Um, because again, we want to operate from a human rights based framework and and recognizing that when people are suffering, um, this, is, this is not a good thing. But in the way that you framed it as kind of this wake up call, I think there, there is a lot of power to the ways in which people are seeing what our impact on our earth is. And, and I think that can be helpful. But I actually, I prepared another slide that I wanna talk about a little bit more because I thought this question might come up. And it's, it's a, from some colleagues at Action Aid wrote an article that I'm happy to send you a link to that's really looking at the connections between climate justice and COVID. And I really liked their take on how we can look at this crisis um, because they were looking at the ways in which the response needed for the pandemic, it provides lessons for the activism that we have been doing and need to continue doing to tackle climate change. So again, coming back to this space of, you know, 
from a human rights perspective, ensuring equal access um, to, to health care, for one, um, ensuring social protections um, and strengthening of our, our health care systems, our paid sick leave, um, our ability to access an income are, are really key here. The ways in which I think we are coming together, um, there's a lot of solidarity to be happy to be had in these spaces, um, but also ensuring that we're looking um, worldwide, what we're looking uh, at, at these transnational movements and what they can offer for solidarity, as well as our solidarity within our communities. Recognizing that market mechanisms are not our savior um, and have not been our savior um, when it's come to the climate crisis as well that this really, um, if anything, is an opportunity to ensure that we are centering ideas of resilience um, as we come out of this, and um, that we continue to have this sense of urgency in, in everything that we're doing and recognizing that we are capable of, of building a better world. Um, so, so I think this really is also, as, as you were saying, it, it is this moment um, for reflecting on all of these things. And, and going back to WeDo's kind of three-part framework of how we're looking at this, we are really um, in conversation and in dialogue with feminist partners from around the world about, you know, what does this mean for migrant justice? Um, what does this mean um, for reproductive rights? How can we understand the dynamics that are starting to happen now, um, particularly with certain state sanctions and what that means for a response that is ultimately rooted in, in justice and in understanding women's rights as human rights. So I, I just hope that we can continue to be in conversation and reflection about what this means. And I think Peter's talk last week, which Maddie shared with me, did a really good job of, of also highlighting this idea that it's not hopeful necessarily when we're looking at how a world without us um, could be so wonderful. Um, so we really want to think about how we are living in harmony with our planet and moving within our planetary boundaries um, as well as having, you know, societies that are fully in, enjoying their, their rights to thrive. Wonderful. So there's another question in the chat. It says, when you talked about transitioning financing from military to universal education, are the greenhouse gas reductions from less military action? Are there greenhouse gas reductions from less military action? Um, I'm not sure that those are counted in that particular offset. So this comes from um, Project Drawdown, and I know a lot of their modeling around what they anticipated the benefits of girls' education would be um, had to do with the decisions that women are making later in their lives around um, family planning and how many children they're having. And so that's also kind of that time scale of the, the gigaton reduction happening by 2050. But I, I can, if you go to Project Drawdown, and, and I'm happy to go back and look at that source as well for exactly how they're doing those calculations and whether or not they're offsetting our military, which absolutely is emitting, um, in addition to looking at the benefits of improving girls' education in that calculation. Are there any other questions? Perfect. Well, if there aren't any um, right now, we will go ahead and wrap up, but I do want to say Tara is willing to stick around for a few minutes. So if you have any questions or just want to continue this conversation, she is more than happy to just hang out for a bit. Um, so with that being said, thank you so, so much, Tara, for virtually pointing in today. Um, and thanks everyone for being here. Uh, announcements for coming up in the future. Um, so next week we will have a showcase. Um, the speaker is TBD. So it was going to be Brian King. Unfortunately, due to the craziness of this whole situation, he is no longer.